Somebody want to pray for us? Get us started into Galatians. Thank you, Zach. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together. Um, God, please help us to um, open our hearts and uh, just get all we can out of what uh, Stephen's going to be teaching us today and out of your word and uh, just, uh, just help us use this information to glorify you, God. And, uh, help us prepare for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are you getting online too? Yeah. 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 Uh, so, we're going to study Galatians as the run up to Riggins. Um, two reasons for that. One, completely selfishly, is my thesis is on Galatians, and I'm starting my thesis this summer, so I'm killing two birds with one stone by teaching Galatians to y'all while I do my research. So, so you only have to research for one thing. Exactly. So what if we change ours to Ephesians? <laughs> How frustrated would that make you? Yeah, I would just be a lot more tired. So uh, I don't want to do that. The other reason is that it's a very, very good book to prepare for a discipleship mission sort of trip because it's all about the gospel. You guys know the two books in, in the New Testament that are literally all about the gospel are Romans and Galatians. They're essentially, they have the same content in Galatians. It's just like the summary form of Romans. Uh, he just says everything a little bit more punctually in Galatians. And it takes more time developing the ideas in Romans. Punctually? Punctually, yeah. Persisting. There you go. That's better. Yeah. Although punctually, it, it kind of serves as a double entendre because he's like really uh, ragging on, on a particular group of people who are preaching a false gospel. So he's, he's throwing punches with his words. Uh, yeah. Uh, before we get into Galatians, Riggins stuff. So everybody, I'm making absolutely sure everybody knows the beach weekend is last weekend in May. Last weekend in May, what May 26th through 28th. What time are we leaving? The 20th is important for some people. Uh, about 5:30, 6 o'clock. I put it in the in the email. Okay. Figure we leave from the northwest part a lot like we have in the past. Uh, I was got Salmons. Can you guys drive your big car to Galveston? To Galveston. Yeah, sure. Probably. Yeah. How okay. far is Galveston? So anybody Salmon. whose last name is Salmon or is over eighteen can ride with you guys, and then people who are not last name Salmon or over eighteen can ride. What with if I don't want to ride with my parents? Wait, like why not? Parents consent. You can get your parents consent too. Y'all be eighteen. Is that uh, wait? So, so you can ride with them. Yeah. But we'll be driving. For legal oh, reasons. <laughs> Wait, Stephen, why can't people yeah, under 18 drive? Yeah, yeah. Because you're an underage driver. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you guys got an erect, then they could sue me. <laughs> so let's drive. Well, wait, well, wouldn't they sue the salmon? You guys haven't all signed your license away yet. Well, so. you should do that before we go. Yeah, or sure. I could just drive. And then I, and then I, yeah. Yeah. Well, you could not. Uh, I don't think how that. I don't know how that would help anyone. So beach weekend is 26 through 28. Everybody should make plans to be there. You're gonna have fun. Doing a few new things and a few old things. Are we going to make Please say we're not making a cardboard boat. <laughs> please, no more cardboard uh, boat. We actually, that didn't work. work. Actually, me and Caleb were talking about that the other day about how you wouldn't let us be on the same team because you knew that we would win. We were actually talking about that earlier and I laughed really hard because I didn't remember. That was like three years ago. Where's my big time? Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> we won that. Uh, with the home group meeting up, running up to Radiant, there's Ten meetings, and so you are allowed to miss four of them. You miss more than four without letting me know ahead of time. Look, I have five things that are very legitimate reasons why I can't be here. There's five planned deaths in my family that I have to be present so for. Really like my mom died five times. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what keeps happening here. Does being late count? What? No. Like, you know, oh. If you're consistently late, that's like a... Let's let's talk about this. Why, why can't you just be here what all time? Like, like what, what's the late mark? Camera has suck, right? I don't know how long the season is. But. Okay. So, yeah, that would be the kind of stuff. Come let me know ahead of time so that we're not at the end of the home group meetings. And I'm going, look, you're only here for three meetings out of the ten. Why should you still get to go to Riggins? And you're like, well, I had this really legitimate excuse. I just refused to tell you ahead of time. <laughs> that's, that's silly. Oh, and my brother, Caleb, he'll, he'll be here probably the rest of the weeks. He just <laughs> had to study for finals. Hey, actually, for funny, for and this, you, get, you get four. That's why you get four absences. So you can take the absences when you get four finals. 
that said, any other questions on rigging and stuff? I think everybody in here officially is. Two Smiths haven't given me your deposits yet. Is that $50? Yeah, yeah the $50. Uh, the Caleb, you're going? I think everybody else cool. is good. Uh, and there's two spots left, which which actually means your two friends and Sam Runyon are, are competing for for two seats. You don't have me on a seat, right? Correct. Okay, yeah. Loser. Uh, Wait, what do you mean? Well, you're not the winner. I'm already going to be up there. So, yeah, they'll be kind of like, we'll so have we 21. So, we expect to be running smoothly and lots and lots of juice participation. You're ignoring me, and I don't like that. <laughs> we'll get more into that. So, starting with Galatians. Turn to Galatians in your Bible. Uh, yes. If you, if you guys have ever heard that uh, General Electric Power Company, you remember the order of the Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I just have the song. That's huge. But there's always a lot of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I'm just saying, expectations are high. I don't know it, Ben. Here's how this is going to go down. Today. Okay, focus in. He's going to be so tan. Bring it in. Me? I don't think I can get any more. I will be so tan. Turn it up. Alright. Josh, I envy your tins. We're going to look at introductory matters in the background, which means uh, we're essentially going to look at some parts of Acts. Like an outline for the book, and then get into the very beginning, and sort of the whole thesis point of the book is at the beginning. So, uh, come on, why aren't you working today? <laughs> Author, uh, Paul. Pretty much nobody contests the idea that Paul wrote Galatians. Uh, people. How do, you, how do you know that Paul wrote it? Uh, well, if you, yeah, if you accept inerr inerrancy and, and divine authority, yeah, he says Paul, an apostle, not for men to introduce himself as Paul. But there are people very strongly in the evangelical church who will say things like, oh yeah, Paul didn't write Ephesians. It was a different. Uh, yeah, people will, like, people were writing in his name. Yeah. You just said Ephesians. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There'll, there'll be people who will contest Pauline authorship with other books, even though it says, Paul, writing to you from this thing. So somebody else was writing in Paul's name, and so they'll, they'll make those cases. Nobody bothers doing that with Galatians, Romans, or 1 Corinthians. Those are the three books that are just like, everyone's absolutely sure, even the atheists who study historical things, they say, yeah, Paul wrote these books. The historical guy, Paul from Tarsus, Jew, converted to Christian, he wrote those three books. So that's not even an issue. The date of the book of Galatians is important. There's two views, northern and southern. For right now, just remember those two. We're going to come back to them in a second. So everybody remember, northern and southern. Northern and northern southern. And southern. southern. Good. southern. The purpose of Galatians. This is the, this is, this is the, the meat. This is why he's writing. He is writing to rebuke Christians who have been tricked by Judaizers into thinking that they must follow the Mosaic law in order to be saved. A couple of big words in there to make sure we understand. What are Judaizers? Anybody know that? Rather than Jews. The Christians that follow the law, so follow the law. Right. They're Jewish Christians who are in the first century, they're saying, look, Gentiles, it's great that you're part of part of the Christian faith, but you're going to have to get circumcised, you're going to have to follow the Mosaic law in order to be saved. But that's how we've always been saved. That's the deal. And Paul's going, no, that is not how you're saved. First off, no, exactly. <laughs> uh, so he's very much... Uh, Rebuking the Christians who are being led away by that, that group of people who are saying, no, you need to follow Jesus law. And uh, you know what the Mosaic Law is, right? Mm. What's the Mosaic Law? The law establishes Moses. Right. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Right. The sacrificial right. system. The law, the Torah, yeah. Right. Uh, keep in your minds, this is a very much, this book can be easily misinterpreted because we try and put it straight into 21st century context a lot. Remember who he's writing to and why he's writing. He's a first century Christian writing to Christians who are being persuaded by Judaism. Okay? Works of the law bring <clears throat> righteousness is their theme. Right? Jewish works of the law. Okay? Sacrifices every day. Being circumcised. 
keeping Shabbat, not uh, keeping the Sabbath, right? Not uh, not going out in a certain certain times of day, and all the, all those sort of things. Not cutting your beard a certain way. Not eating pork. Those things are what he's talking about when he says works. Okay. That's gonna we're gonna be repeating that a lot as we move forward through Galatians, but. We, we tend to pull this book into 21st century terms too quickly. We say, oh yeah, it works. We know what works are. And then we talk about, yeah, works are doing good things for your neighbor. And all, all these things that we in 21st century Christians say, these are works. And that's not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about, specifically, 1st century Jewish following the law works. I'll, I'll hammer that into your heads a little bit more as we work through the book. The message. So that was the purpose. That's why he's writing. He's writing because these guys are being led away by a false gospel. The message of the book, what he's saying to these guys who are being led away is, you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Not by works. Works of the law, in particular. Okay. Funnily enough, that particular verse doesn't appear in Galatians, it appears in Ephesians, right? You're saved by grace, through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But the message of Galatians is essentially that verse. It's you're saved by grace through faith, not by works of the law. The key verse, there's plenty you could pull out that kind of summarize that idea. 216b is the one that I, that I believe. We've believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. No one will be justified, made right, made holy by works of the law. Steve, yeah. I have a... I have a um, like a summary or whatever, analysis of the different books, yeah. and um, mine gives it, I mean, you said it could be many, but yeah. mine specifically says 5-1. Oh, okay. Uh, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So it's, yeah. it's same idea, but I'm just thinking. Yeah, the idea being, summarize the idea for me. But not by works. Yeah. Okay. Saved by... Grace alone through faith. You don't have to follow the law to be saved. Yeah. Yeah, it could. Uh, those are the basic introductory matters. We're going to dig in a little bit to the southern and northern view things. So, other thing about the context. Tell me a little bit about Paul. Who is he? How did he become a Christian? What's his story? Well, first, tribe of Benjamin. He was originally Saul. Tribe of Benjamin. He was originally Saul from Tarsus. Yeah, and he was uh, killed Jews. Yeah, he killed Jews. Killed and then Jesus arrested uh, Christians, right? Killed Christians. Christians, right. And then uh, revealed himself on the road to Paul. And Jesus revealed himself on the road to Damascus to Paul. Struck him blind, right? Mm -hmm. Scales over his eyes. Yeah. Uh, what did he do after that? After his conversion? He went on three missionary journeys. <laughs> yeah, he went on yeah at least three missionary journeys that are described in what book? Acts. Acts. Acts, yeah. The second half of Acts is essentially detailing Paul's three missionary journeys throughout Asia Minor. Uh, good. And he's preaching the gospel. Uh, what is his usual mode of, of operation? He goes into a new city. Where does he go first? The Jews. He goes to Jerusalem first, right? Well, yeah, he's, he's in Jerusalem, the city. But when he goes into a new um, city, where what place in the city does he go to? He said temple. Yeah, the synagogue. Because mm -hmm. there's only one temple, it's in Jerusalem. But synagogue. Uh, where, where the Jews would meet, right? Uh, he goes into the synagogue. He participates in their usual uh, Saturday morning uh, worship rituals, right? He reads the scriptures, and he preaches Jesus. That's, that's how he did. He shows up. He says, look, I'm a well-respected Jew. Studied under, under Gamaliel. That's, we meet that guy in Acts. He's like, oh, well, you know Gamaliel. You, you study under him. You want to read the scriptures for us. Uh, exactly. Uh, come on in, teach us. He does, and then he starts teaching, and then he teaches Jesus. Right? That's what he does. Every single new city he goes to. And half of the people in the audience are like, oh my gosh, the Messiah has come. This guy knows what he's talking about. He's right. And the other half of the, half of the Jews are like, uh, we're going to run you off and try to kill you, because we don't like Jesus. And there's this repeated story that we see in Acts, in every single new city he goes to. Okay, good. we got the, the basic context. Southern view and northern view of Galatians, the, the southern and northern reviews, to what region of, this, of Galatia is he writing to? Is he writing to southern Galatia? So if you look on the map, and you have the map on the back page of your notes. So that you see the word Galatia right here, right? So Galatia describes this whole 
column area in the middle of Asia Minor. Okay? So the question is, is he writing to the southern area down here, kind of where he visited on his first missionary journey? Or is he writing to this northern area where some would say that he sort of made a trek into on his second missionary journey? All right. So after which missionary journey does he write this letter to Galatia? And so the date relates to kind of where he visited when. Uh, the reason this is important, the reason that I even bother telling you all this, is because there's this big important event that happened in between Paul's two missionary journeys. Anybody know what that big important event was? It's described in Acts chapter 15. Jerusalem Council. Jerusalem Council, yeah. Jerusalem Council, where they get together and they essentially ask and answer the question, what do Gentiles have to do to be saved? Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the law? And they have this big debate, and the Christians go, no, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised to be Christians. Right? Big important event. So the, the question is, is he writing this before that event or after it? Because that was a big paradigm shift for the Christians. Now that we had firm, confer like, we all got together and decided this is how it's going to be. So is he writing this book, recognizing that this has already been decided, or before it has already been decided, and he's sort of making his case. Right? The northern or the southern view says he's writing this before, so this is right after his first missionary journey, writing before to the southern area to all the churches that he visited on his first missionary journey. He gets back to Antioch, and then he can go and have the Jerusalem Council. The northern view says that he's writing after his second missionary, or after his second missionary, after they've already had the Jerusalem Council. And we're going to actually go through Acts and look at the Jerusalem Council in a bit of detail in just a bit. So either the date is 46 AD or 53 AD, depending on which view you take. I think that the southern view is better for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, he doesn't mention the Jerusalem Council in the letter, which it, it would seem like he would, given the content of the letter, he would mention, just as we decided, at the Jerusalem Council, this is what I'm preaching to you. Uh, the other thing, there's a few little cues uh, that seem to say, talk about, seem to mention the, the Southern view more strongly, and we'll, as we encounter them, I'll bring them up in the text. Uh, last thing is, for the Northern view, you have to suggest that he went on this sort of side trip on his second missionary journey into Northern Galatia that isn't recorded in Acts, uh, which is feasible because he went through there, but you have to say that on his way between Pisidia and Troas, he takes this like little little side trip over into northern Galatia and plants a couple churches. And it's like, that's not in the text. Why are you saying that? So, everybody with me on the two views, why they're important, and why I take the view that I do. It is not important for salvation, whether you take the northern view or the southern view of Galatia. <laughs> that's that's a, very much a minor issue, but... Since we're learning this book in detail, you got to know some of the things that are around it. Uh, Simply for your interpretation. Exactly. So you can be better Bible studiers. Uh, now we'll get the background. So, turn to Acts. We're going to sort of sprint through Acts chapters 10 through 15 to really get a feel for the controversy that is producing this letter. I'll feel free to ask questions when we move on. Uh-huh. 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 So big. Acts. Acts is the same. Yeah, Acts is the same. Where is it? Oh, I think our cast is left there. It's always before. Yeah. So we kind of talked about this a little bit. Chapter 9 is, is Paul's conversion, right? Strike on the road to Damascus. Chapter 10 is about Peter. And... Peter gets this vision of a sheet, all these different animals on it. God says to him in the vision, you know, stand up, kill, eat, do not call not unclean what I have made clean. clean. Right? What's the point of this vision? Anybody? The Gentiles have, they can have Christ be Yeah, Gentiles can be saved. They can be saved. Uh, and so he goes over to this Gentile named Cornelius, who's expecting him, because he had a vision also. Some people mistakenly <clears throat> say that that's about meat, what kind of meat. Yeah. Okay. I was really kind of disappointed when I read that passage in context and I found out that the Bible wasn't, that that passage wasn't specifically about you can now eat bacon. Yeah. It did, I mean, it did end up doing that too, but that wasn't the point of it. <laughs> uh, 
Well, so can I add something there? Yeah. So we're studying Acts in our Bible study. There's a Bible study. One of the cool things about the big deal about Peter, about Peter taking that vision, is that Cornelius and his his gang were sent to his house, and it was it was uh, not tradition for Jews to bring Gentiles into their home. Right. Are you going to give me that argument? No, no, I wasn't. Okay. Good. So it was even a big deal for Peter to even welcome them into his home, because that was and the tradition is that they they not that, that they would. They would, uh, their, their home would be unclean by bringing Gentiles into their home. Right. So that was a big deal. Yeah, and then the fact that after that, Peter goes to Cornelius' right. house, and he goes and he has a meal with them. Yeah. So, so he's letting Gentiles into his house, and he's going into Gentiles' houses. You don't do that. Uh, Cornelius and his whole family hear the gospel and believe, uh, speak in tongues to ratify this, this reality. Uh, and then chapter 11, we're actually going to read the first half of it. So this whole interaction happens. Peter preaches the gospel to Gentiles under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they believe, and it's this big paradigm shift, right? It's this, what, how do we account for this? This wasn't what we were expecting. We've only been preaching to Jews up to this point. Uh, or at least we, we thought that only Jews could be saved. And so Peter gets back to, uh, to Jerusalem and... Some people have some questions for him. They, they got a bone to pick with him. So we're going to read chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. So you want to read that for me? The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and, Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, eat and kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. At Pentecost. It doesn't say at Pentecost, but I have that assignment. Right, yeah, we talked about that two weeks ago mm -hmm. at the beginning. Is that it? Uh, keep going at 18. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. All right. So tell me what happened. Peter gets back to Jerusalem. Who comes up to him? Circumcised Jews. Yeah. Or Christians. Or the circumcision party. The, the group of, of people within the Christian group who are saying, the Jewish party ever. Yeah. They're saying, well, we, you know, you got to be circumcised to, to be a real Christian. Peter says, well, actually, let me tell you about this thing that happened to me over the weekend. Uh, had a vision. Went and talked to the Jews. And so uh, verse 16 onward is kind of the, the summary, the point. What's, what's the point? Remember the word of the Lord. That, uh, you know, they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so if they were baptized the same way we were at the beginning, right, at Pentecost... How could I justify making this sort of a distinction that we can't eat with the uncircumcised? We can't have non-Jews in the church. That's his point. What is the circumcision party's reaction? Oh, well, I guess that's okay. Yeah. They fell silent. It's like, like, I don't like this, but I guess I have to deal with it because that's what God said. <laughs> so, praise his name. I guess we'll get on board. This is, this is an example of a proper reaction to a revelation from God. Yeah, I don't like it, but he's right, so... <laughs> I mean, he is God. Yeah, so 
So you must be right. So I don't have any indication in, like, I don't see any indication that they were begrudgingly agreeing to it. Yeah, part of that is, it's in the, it's in the phrase, they fell silent. Okay. And uh, in further context from knowing the circumcision party and what we see where, later where, developed into. What verse is it where they, uh, no further objections. Uh, so, you got this little interaction with the circumcision party and the Jews. Hey, camera. Uh, chapter 12 is Peter's miraculous release from prison after Herod arrests him and then Herod, Herod's death. Uh, chapter 13, Paul, or he's still Saul at this point. Saul comes up and he becomes Paul on this trip. Uh, starts his first missionary journey. He goes off through... Get the math back up there. So he, he goes on his, he leaves from Antioch, and he heads down to Paphos, Perga, Pisidia. He gets to Antioch, and he preaches a really stirring message. <clears throat> so he's, he's making his trek around, and we're going to read a little, at the end of his message in Antioch, what happens. So uh, if you turn to Acts 13, Paul's on his way through, the, through the, the country, preaching to Jews. And uh, I'll pick up verse 42. This is right as he finishes his message in the synagogue, right? He just finished preaching the gospel. He preached, Jesus is the Messiah. You guys need to believe. Uh, verse 42, chapter 13. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Give us the gospel again. We want to learn this. After the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Many Jews and converts to Judaism, so Gentiles who had, who had become Jews previously, are now all becoming Christians here in, in Antioch. And Paul's, Paul and Barnabas are like, great, good on you. Continue in the grace of God, right? Forget the law. Remember grace. Verse 44, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the, gospel, for the Gentiles, that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. I love the phrasing of that, by the way. As many who were appointed to, to eternal life believed. It kind of throws us for a loop in terms of the order of events. But anyway. <laughs> Give a little Calvinism plug there. <laughs> Uh, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews inside the devout with of high-standing leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, drove them out of their district. A uh, couple things to, to know for context. So uh, you got the Jews and then the Gentiles who had become Jews, right? Anybody know the, the term for that often used in here in the Bible when you see it? Say again. Proselytes would be one term. The God-fearers would be another another way. If you see the God-fearers, it's talking about Jews or Gentiles who hadn't quite become Jews because they they didn't want to get circumcised, but they were really really interested in Judaism. They come around the temple. They sit in a different place in the synagogue. There's all this very big separations. Gentiles were only allowed to go so far into the temple. Jews were in on the inner circle. Gentiles are on the outer circle. So. Paul shows up and preaches the idea that the Gentiles can be saved by grace through faith, just like the Jews, and some of the Jews get right on board, and some of the Jews really don't like that idea. Right? There's this division, there's this wall that we keep between us. There's, the Gentiles are over there, they don't follow our laws, they're not quite as holy as us. We are God's chosen people. Uh, and Paul and Barnabas, when, when, the, when these inner circle Jews who don't want this, this message start rebelling against them, what do they say? Verse 46. What's their reaction? Yeah. 
it, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you rep repudiate it. Is that the word? Repudiate? Repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Like, look, you were supposed to be saving these guys, and you didn't do it. But the gospel's here now. So since you had the option to believe, and you gave it the finger, uh, we're going to turn to the Gentiles now. They're, they're, they're allowed to be with us. And this was the deal from the beginning. Quote scripture to support it's that. It's almost as if he's saying, you're not special. Yeah, exactly. And the Gentiles hear that, and they're like, yeah, we'll become Christians. We don't have to get circumcised to, to be saved. This is great. <laughs> Best day ever. <laughs> and the word of the Lord was spreading through the whole region. The, the gospel is going out, and there's this tension growing. Okay? Now we've got, in every city, we're starting to see Jews who really don't like this Christian message that the, Jesus was the Messiah and that they had killed him. And they're turning the Gentiles against them, and the, they... There's this big tension brewing. All right? And we see this pretty much from the beginning of Acts. Chapter 7, you know, you got the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews and arguing over whose widows are being cared for. And that's what made deacons. You remember this? Chapter 7 of Acts. So we got this, this brewing. Uh, chapter 14, he finishes up his, his missionary journey, uh, gets mistaken for a pagan god, Elystra. He's like, no, don't worship me, worship God. He gets back to Antioch. Put a map back up, up, up there. He gets back to Antioch at the end of chapter 14. And this controversy is coming to a head. Right? They've got to answer this question. So we'll pick up in verse 24 of chapter 14. This is as they're coming back through to get back to Antioch, which is where we pick it up. They passed through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia, and, uh, Attilia excuse me, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. They made the full circle. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. First we had Peter's testimony of going to Gentiles. Now we got Paul and Barnabas', Barnabas testimony of how Gentiles are coming to faith. The gospel is being believed. Verse 28, they remained no little time with disciples. Chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you're circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. So this would be the members of the circumcised circumcision party who weren't there with Peter, who praised and glorified God, and who dug into their hole. No, you really got to be circumcised. So these are the Judaizers. Right. Unless you're being circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 2, and after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, they argued for a while. These, these Judaizer guys, they came in and said, you got to be circumcised. And Paul and Barnabas were like, uh, no, you don't. We got a whole lot of Gentiles who are believing and being saved that would prove that you are wrong, sir. Paul and Barnabas, after that dissension, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So like, we got to get this answered. So this is the Jerusalem Council. Verse 3. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders who declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to be circumcised. Excuse me. It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Question. Is it, who, who are these people who are talking? What does it say? Pharisees. Yeah, some who belong to the party of the Pharisees. Now what also, also do we know about these guys from context? Not only are they Pharisees, but they are also... Pharisees would be Jews. They're, they're also Christians, right? They wouldn't even be invited to this meeting to make this case if they weren't considered part of the church. Right? So, 
again, kind of breaking your, your stereotypes, when you think Pharisee, we in the 21st century, oh yeah, bad guys. That's not always necessarily the case. There are some Pharisees who became real, true Christians. Nicodemus, one of them in, in the book of John. They just had their own issues, <laughs> their own doctrinal problems. One of them was we couldn't recognize the Messiah when he showed up, and then when he rose again, we decided, you know what, we still don't want to believe him. There were lots of those guys. Some of them, though, believed, but they were still stuck in their tradition. So that's what their deal is. Pharisees rose up, say it's necessary for them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. So verse 6 of chapter 15 of Acts. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and gave a speech. Somebody want to read what Peter says up through verse, the end of verse 11? Starting from verse what? From seven. In the... Fifteen. Glad to know you're following along. Wait, if it, wait. Fifteen seconds. Well, after yeah. there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God chose me to preach to the Gentiles so they would hear the message of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart and heart, um, and God who knows the heart and has testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between them and us, cleansing their hearts by faith. So now we, so now why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. All right, so what's Peter say, essentially? What is, how does he contend with these, these Pharisees who are saying? You're wrong. Yeah, this you're is, wrong. This is the real, real way it is. Right. Not, in, not even we could follow the law, nor our ancestors. We couldn't do it. What is, how is the right way that we're saved? By grace through faith. Uh, then verse 12, somebody else stands up and gives a testimony. All the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas kind of say, yeah, Peter's got it. This is what's been going on with us. Same thing, the Gentiles are being saved. And they finished speaking, and James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon, Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may see the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from things that have been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has in every city those who proclaim him for his red and Sabbath in the synagogues. And this seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men, send them out to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas to give this news. This is the decision that they reached. So they write a letter, and this is the decision. What's the decision? You don't have to be circumcised. You follow these basic morality things that everyone agrees on. A whole lot more you could dig into with the Council of Jerusalem, but we're studying Galatians, not Acts. So. True. Uh, everybody understand the context of what this, this, this strife that is going on in the church. Okay. Trying to really hammer home the point that, that we are in the first century with Jews and Gentiles, Jews who are very much steeped in traditions of men and the Mosaic Law and relating that to salvation, with Gentiles who are worshiping pagan gods for all their lives and then believe in Jesus as the Savior from death. And we're trying to mesh these two groups together. And the Jews over here are telling the Gentiles over here, you got a whole lot of extra stuff you got to do to really be saved, to really be in God's good graces. And Paul is writing against that with the book of Galatians. 
That is a backdrop. Any questions? I have a question, but yeah. it's not quite related. Um, was it widely known what God told Ananias whenever he didn't want to go to Paul? And God said, Paul needs to find out how much he's going to suffer for me. He's, he, I have chosen him to speak to the Gentiles. Uh, I, just, I have no yeah, idea. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Because if, that's, if they took Ananias, Ananias at, or is that it? Ananias. Um, then God said he's going to preach to the Gentiles, which to me would mean, okay, that means there's going to be some believers within the Gentiles. Yeah, my guess based on context would be that it wasn't widely known or held as authoritative okay. yet in Barnabas, this story. Barnabas even had to defend all Barnabas stepped in. That's what the thing about Barnabas is right. he, he had to step in. Right, with the other Jews. Yeah, tell him, no, this is the guy, and then he's for real. I've seen his work. Yeah, exactly. So, he's definitely preaching the gospel now and not trying to kill us anymore. Uh, yeah, so... Obviously, it was widely known once Luke wrote the book of Acts. Right. Well, just but. the whole thing about the question about Gentiles becoming believers. I right. thought it was God had said something at that point. But. Yeah, and he had any. I mean, he said stuff in the Old Testament all over the place. It's yeah. just that they weren't looking for that. Yeah. And when you're steeped in the traditions of men, it's hard to break those traditions. Like, if. If if you tried to to stop passing the communion communion plate in some Baptist churches and say, we're just going to put a box at the back of the church for people to make donations if they want, you'd have riots. Because we're steeped in the traditions of men instead of just worrying about how to fix it. Traditions of men aren't necessarily bad. It's when you put those traditions on par with what is Im important and commanded by God. That's when they become commanded by God. The, the, the way... Oh. I, said, I said communion, excuse me, I meant offering plates when I was... Uh, my bad, I was... This statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Offering plates. If you're passing the offering plates, and instead you're going to put, a, put it back in that. There are Baptist churches who will, they will split over that kind of a thing. Uh, I remember Rob Holster did a big sermon kind of about this, but he was talking about how like a church was in a huge fight about having a light up sign for the church. Yeah. Like there was like one side and they were like yelling at each other, and like the pastor of that church got in trouble. Uh, because, uh, like, who cares about sign, like, because whatever, but, like, and he almost got fired, but, like, I don't know, just little stuff like that. Exactly. And, it, yeah, that's, lest we think that we're better than the Jews of the first century, we have our own things that we try to add to the gospel, and Paul would be writing to us saying, are you kidding me? This is what you're adding to the gospel? No. Grace alone through faith alone. But we have to put ourselves into their context to understand the message properly, and then we can apply it to our context. So, that's the intro to Galatians. Now let's get into the text. Uh, let's flip back to Galatians 1. This is our outline, by the way, of our 10 meetings. So, we're going through just 12 verses today, and then we'll, we'll do slightly larger chunks as we go. And you can see where our VBS preps are scattered throughout there. So hold on to your notes if you want to know what are we doing this week at Home Group. That's what we're doing. Um, yeah. May 21st, we're doing VBS prep at the beginning or the end? Uh, probably at the end. I'm going to teach that one. I'll, I'll make sure to cut us off at like Is there going to like be four, VBS prep? Uh, no. The 21st? Oh, well, actually, I don't know. We haven't really planned exactly what we might actually do somewhere. Yeah, um, I'm just, the reason I ask is I'm getting most likely going to be late on the 21st. Okay. Which is on that list, but I'm just saying. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. We'll start out with verses 1 through 5. So this is the outline for, for today's section of text. Greeting, the purpose for writing, the purpose is the gospel. And the source of Paul's gospel. I put Paul's in quotes because it's not really Paul's gospel, but it's the gospel that Paul preached. Uh, first of all, the greeting. Verses 1 through 5. Somebody want to read verses 1 through 5 for me? Everybody read along. It's good practice. To read the text along with somebody who's reading out loud. Paul an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. 
grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Seems like a pretty standard greeting, right? This is who's writing. This is who I'm writing to. Uh, quick salutation. Grace to you. He says that in a bunch of his letters. There's a lot more here than, than meets the eye, actually. Uh, present evil age. What? Like I just present evil age. Present evil age, yeah, I was talking about that. Uh, first off, Paul, an apostle, aside, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, whom he raised from the dead. And all the brothers who are with me, grace to you. Hello. This kind of aside is, is kind of unique in Paul's letters. He doesn't normally do that. Uh, he, he starts out with, the, the as we're going to see as we read through Galatians, the, the first half of the letter, the first half of the first chapter at least, is him saying, this is why I'm right. And half of the argument for why he's right is because I'm an apostle and Jesus told me to give this message himself. I didn't get this from some guy who got it from some guy. Jesus Christ struck me on the road to Damascus and he gave it to me. This is the message I got and it's not changing. Right. So he slips that in at the very beginning, just kind of setting, that, setting it up. By the way, I'm not an apostle because of men. I'm not an apostle because some guy told me that I could do this. The guy who told me to do this was... Jesus. V guy. V guy, right? Yeah. Uh, he also summarizes the gospel very, very succinctly. Through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I mean, you, you want to summarize the gospel, that's one way to do it. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Really, really succinct summary. There's a little bit more. But, otherwise. Pretty good summary. He, he expands on that throughout the way. Uh, also, we're going to look at verses 10 through 12, but he, he harps on this not from men. I'm not trying to please men. This is God's thing, not not man's thing, in verses 10 through 12. We're going to see at the end of the day. Uh, verse 4, though. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God. God and Father, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. What is this the summary of? Uh, John. Yeah, there you go. Well, AKA the gospel. The good news. <laughs> He's going to summarize the gospel in a lot of sentences in this book, by the way. But when would that present evil age end? Good question. So yeah, what is the present evil age, first of all? What is he referring to when he says this present evil age? Is it, is it this present evil age, or is it the present evil age he was referring to during that time? Like good. Okay, so good. So which one is it? When you say this present evil age, are we still in it? Or are we talking about some specific context with him in the first century. What do you think? Well, well he's saying this, so he's not talking about right now, he's talking about like then. Yeah, back then he was saying, back then. But, since it's the summary of the gospel, and the gospel applies to us now. But he says the present evil age, not this. But I think if you're referring to like the fact that there's just a Yeah, but the age. present, so that was then, because right now that would be the past evil. Where yeah, so he says it's still the present. So it's just oh, saying when he wrote it, it was the present. Of the evil age and I know, but is this still the present? Is this still is part of the same about? age? There like you go. Okay, so Nathan's, Nathan's, Nathan's on the track. So there's a defining characteristic of some age, and it's evil. Okay, What is that age? When? What's the starting point and what's the end point of this present evil age? The evil age. When does it start and when does it end? What's your reference? So there you go. There's one major interpretation. First sin to the last sin. So the present, this present evil age, I'd be referring to Genesis 3.15, from the fall, up through Revelation 21, when Christ returns a second time. That might be a reference to the present evil age. What might be another idea? What, is, what would be the starting points and end points that he might be referring to? Rome ruling? From when we're... Rome ruling, okay. 
Yeah, so the, the tyranny that, that the Jews and the Christians were under from the Roman oppression. That might be the present evil age. So would have end point would have been about 70 AD. Beginning point would have been uh, when Rome came to power in early 200s BC. But that doesn't make as much sense because he's delivering us from the present evil age. He's, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. So that would only mean that he was only delivering you from your sin during that age and not the others, which wouldn't make Correct. sense because we're still delivered. Good, yes, using context. So, so what, how do, why does he bring up the present evil age? Well, it's as a follow-up to gave himself for our sins to deliver us from it. So Nathan's interpretation that's true. seems to make a little bit more sense from context. And yes, that's the one that I take. The present evil age is the one in which Satan is ruling on the earth. And the the fall of the age. Sure. Yeah. Right. So from fall to resurrection is the present evil age. Fall to resurrection or fall to second coming? Mm -hmm. Resurrection. I meant our, our resurrection. Oh, yeah. uh, good. See how we used context to, to work through that? Yeah. Great how the Bible is. Uh, also, he keeps going. To deliver us from this present evil age. So he, he gave us the gospel. Right? Christ died on the sins to save us from died on the cross to save us from our sins. Uh, according to the will of God the Father. Really easy question and answer here. Whose will is it? God the Father. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's God the Father's will that Christ would die on the cross to save us from our sins. Does that not seem contrary? Considering the massive evil that killing God if his life was freely given by himself, he has a sacrifice. It would be his will, but since they are interlinked, they're, they're, you know, um, the Trinity. Right, okay. Kind of see where I'm going. A little bit, yeah. Uh, That's why it's so significant, because he did, it was a sacrifice. I mean, that, and that it had to have been that because of the way sin is paid for, so to speak, in the, even in the Old Testament with the sacrifice of the perfect lamb and, and things like that. Right. Jesus is the capital T yeah. lamb. Yeah, so. okay, good. Yeah, you, you guys are, are hitting on it. But I, I want to first put in your mind, realize that the, the greatest evil that's ever been per perpetrated on this earth was killing God right? in, in human flesh. Wait, is it the same? The greatest evil that's been ever perpetrated on this earth is killing God in flesh. The greatest evil that's ever been, that, that's ever happened on this earth is with the cross. Okay, got it. Sorry, I was yeah. thinking I didn't forget about the that. golden compass. And yet that yeah. that <laughs> evil polar <laughs> bears. That evil was ordained and planned according to the will of God Himself. He is kind of is a tangential thing to a, to a larger apologetic argument of, of how is God, how do we deal with evil in the world? The problem of evil? How, how, why would a good God let evil happen in this world? What's the deal? Why doesn't he just get rid of it? Either he's not all good or he's not all powerful, because evil wouldn't be here if, if, he, if he was both of those things. But he is both of those things. But he is both of those things, so how do you answer the question? It's all part of his plan. Yeah, and... Here's something that I'm also gonna gonna throw at you, and some of you might disagree, and that's fine. Uh, this might be a conversation we have after home group sometimes. I totally but, disagree. Uh, I I will not say that God is the author of evil. Uh, he did not create evil, mm -hmm. but He is responsible for evil. What do you mean you by responsible? And, and this, He is like He created the earth, knowing that evil was going to exist. And he let it happen. And he let it happen. Okay. He allowed for the possibility of it to happen. Exactly. Yeah. He, he didn't have to made. create the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't have to put it in the garden. He didn't have to give the command to Adam and Eve not to eat it, knowing full well that they would not follow that command and that they would sin. And then there's the other idea. He did all of that ahead of time, knowing that that was going to happen. So, in a sense, God is responsible for evil on this earth. It is his fault, and that's in quotes. And lots of people don't like that idea. 
And it took me a long time to get comfortable with that idea. That he did not create evil, but he is responsible for evil. And he's responsible for it in both senses. One, that he is the ultimate source of it. That's a terrible, terrible word. I don't mean the ultimate source of it. He, but he, he created the, the possibility and the reality. He ordained it. He created yeah. free will. He ordained it. Yeah, he created free will. He's the source of everything, including evil, kind of. Yeah. I mean, everything is here because of him. And since evil is here, that means that it's here because of him. Evil right. Is so he's responsible for it in that sense. Exactly what he says. Existence like is because... Gets traced back to him. Right. In a, yeah. Not in a direct sense, but in an indirect sense. The indirect He's reason. also responsible for it in the same way that a parent is responsible for his child. And that he's going to clean up the messes that the child makes. Right? Your kid goes... If you, if you have a kid and you let him loose in a china shop and he breaks a whole bunch of stuff, the parent is the one who has to pay the china shop back. Well, depending on how old the kid is. Yeah. And if the kid yes. is I'm talking like a three-year-old. But you're using that as an argument for God cleaning up his mess. Sort of. Uh, That's your bad illustration. Very... What, 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 I, what I'm getting at is... the relationship he's... between the person who made it happen. Like, it's not necessarily making the mess and cleaning up the mess, it's just the relationship between the thing that make, that's making the mess. Yes. It's the parents he's, loving the he's child. He's responsible for it in that he's going to ultimately to... bring evil to an end. If he wasn't going to do that, he would not He would not be a good guy. The argument would hold true. If he was not going to fix evil in the end, he would not be all good. But since he is, you can hold true to the fact that he is all good and all powerful. And... Okay. Quick thing, and this is something that's always bothered me, and I, I mean, it's something that, I mean, I believe in God and His will is, you know, the best option, obviously, but it's always something that's bothered me, just the thought of why would He create, like, He knew evil was going to happen, right, and so a bunch of people are going to hell, but why would He create us all at all if half of us are going to go to hell anyways? Right. Or like half the world's gonna go to hell, because and then the other half's going to heaven. And that's but. because you said so. Yeah, <laughs> because he is. Because he is proving his God. God. This, this is these are good conversations to have, and they're they're very tender. Caleb, question or yes. comment? Do you think that if the tree of knowledge of good evil had not been there, that we still would have sinned? There have been I no potential for sin. That was the only wrong thing that could have done. Yeah, hey, my answer is actually what Nathan said. It's like, there, there's there's no way of, no, of of intelligently answering that question. It's the same as asking if if blue ideas do sleep quick, quickly, do giraffes poop in the nighttime? Absolutely. Wait, what? Blue ideas That's do awesome. sleep well, quickly. Yeah. <laughs> it makes the same well, amount of sense. Well, well, blue ideas sleep quickly. They sinned before they ate for the tree of good and evil because doing that was a sin. I thought she was going into why giraffes don't have that. No. That's what I was. Sorry. But yeah, my my actual answer to that question is is there's there's no intelligent way to answer that question of if this hadn't happened would it be different well it didn't and so we're talking about an imaginary world so yeah sure i would think it would blue ideas do sleep quickly but actually but that's you believe in dimensional and in dimension but but i don't so uh did you have a question well i was just going to say to what Zach said it's you know why would why would he create mankind knowing that half of them were going to hell anyway. It's better to have loved and lost to never have loved and lost. Oh. <laughs> no, and that, no, to rephrase that question, if we want to get into it, to rephrase that question of it would have been better for God not to do that <laughs> is the implicit <laughs> argument you're making. It would have been better for God not to create at all. And you, as a created being, can't legitimately make that argument. It would be better for me never to exist in order for me to exist. Because you wouldn't be able to make that argument if you didn't exist. So it can't be inherently better. And also, this argument wouldn't really, exist if what you're arguing for actually were the truth. We really don't have the right to right. make that question either. No. So yeah, no. But it, it, that gets back into morality. Which is better? Well, whatever God says is better. Since God said we're doing it this way, it must be better. Right. I mean, yeah. Exactly. The question that Zach is asking is, yes. you're, you're, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but you're, the question is questioning the goodness of God. And... God is perfectly good. He's perfectly loving. And if evil exists only in the absence of love, right, or right, or good. Okay? So, just like darkness exists without light, right? The light has to exist for darkness to exist. Um, 
evil has to exist if good exists. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. One has to come before the other. So um, when in the garden, um, Satan was trying to twist God's goodness and, and saying that Adam and Eve have that same ability. They, they are good, and because they are good, they are like God. Okay, and so you should be able to do as just like God, you should be able to do as you please, right? But because God created Adam and Eve, him being the author, he had every right to tell Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of, of, of good and evil, the knowledge of, of good and evil. So when we ask the question, why did God do this? We are questioning his very character, his very essence. God is good. And so, um, it's a great philosophical discussion, but it's not the question we should ask. And, and where God's love, and this is where this is where we lose sight of. And I'm getting a little, a little bit. Sorry, this is where we lose sight of that. Is that God, even though evil exists because of because of the the, the absence of good, um, God made a way to make it right again. And that's why He sent Jesus was to 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 uh, to forever. Eliminate the power of evil over us. And that the, the to piggyback that I 100% amen to everything he just said. The the uh, the, the question of, of 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 faith, particularly in the Old Testament, what was saving faith made of in the Old Testament? Right, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Right. I, th I think that that faith was faith that God is who he says he is. He says he is good even though it looks to us like he's not. And that's the saving, that's, and that's why that answer of, of it, it's prefaced upon faith. It's, that's, the, that's the belief that you're, that you're going with. And that's the faith that saves you. It's belief that God is who he says he is. That everything he says is true even when we don't necessarily see that uh, good good side discussion so all that from from the one sentence according to the will of God the Father uh, back into Galatians chapter 4 uh, excuse me chapter 1 verse 4 according to the will of God our Father verse 5 to whom be the glory forever and ever amen I just always anytime dispensationalism pops up and we're pointing out dispensationalism raises its ugly head. The third tenet of dispensationalism, I mean, all of creation and history is for the glory of God, primarily. That's right. All of this, he sums up with, to the praise and glory of God. That's, that's why all of this was done. So, uh, again, that's a side side. That's the third dispensation? Third point of dispensation. Oh, uh, second section is where he he gets into it. Like he doesn't he doesn't after that that introduction he does not continue with any kind of pleasantry. It's like it's so good to I, I miss you guys. I long to see you like he does in the book of Philippians. None of that. He gets right to it. With I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Uh, so quickly would be one of the supports for the southern view for the date, right? So if he had established churches in the first on his first missionary journey, come back, had the the Jerusalem Council, gone on his second missionary journey, seen all of the churches that he established, established a few more in Galatia, came back and then wrote the letter, so quickly doesn't make as much sense as if this is right after his first missionary journey. He gets back from his first missionary journey, and then he gets word that the Galatians are already abandoning the gospel. He's like, I just saw you guys a, six months ago. What's the... So I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace. Like, eight years is a little bit more reasonable. For oh, eight years, and you have a doctrinal problem. All right. Well, yeah. So quickly doesn't make it. Anyway. Uh, the point of that sentence, though, isn't that the so quickly, it's the deserting him who called you and are turning to a different gospel. So, to what gospel are they turning? The gospel a different one. Yeah, which would say the law. 
What, what, what would be the Judaizers' gospel? Yeah, believe in Jesus, but also get circumcised and follow the Jewish law, because that's how you're really saved. So really nothing different than what they already believe. What the do you Jews mean? already believe. Right. Um, yeah, so he's... Good, good clarification. He's talking to Christians who are being led away by this. So he's talking to Jewish Christians who are being like tempted to go back to the law and Gentile Christians who are being tempted to start obeying the law even though they, they never have before because these Jewish these Judaizers are are coming in from the outside. So when you say Judaizers, you don't mean do you mean like are there Christians but they they're still practice they still practice right. the old law? Well there's the the uh, but mostly, um, I mean, there are Jewish Christians now who they're they're uh, complete Jew, complete Jews, where they still observe a lot of the, the uh, traditions, traditions, sacraments, rituals that the Jewish faith has brought in. But these are these are Jews. These are Jews who believe in Christ. That they has that more <coughs> So, so there's some that you, you're actually bringing up a, a, a discussion in, uh, among the, the scholarship. Are the Judaizers within the church or from without, the, from outside of the church? Okay. And, and I, I think it's both. So I think that there are some non-Christian Jews who are saying to Christians they have good relationship with them, saying you really need to follow the Jewish law to be saved. Like I know you got this whole whole Jesus thing, you're a part of the church, that's good, but the Jewish law is what you really need. And there are some Jewish Christians who actually do believe the gospel, but are also adding to it the following the law thing. Yeah, following Jesus. And they're trying to right. convince. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you. Like, I follow Jesus too. But, you know, if you want to be a real Christian, we have to follow these, these other traditions as well. Uh, so they're adding more of a works based. Exactly. And that's. They're doing like Christ plus, though. That, that's yeah. the. Jesus plus. Here's the here's another question. So what we're all talking about Judaizers, right? Uh, how do you know that that's the answer to that question? There you go. Yeah, not from the t context of this letter, right? This letter does not say specifically in so many words. This is the false gospel that you're believing. We know that from the context of the time, reading the book of Acts, seeing the history, uh, reading the other letters that Paul is writing at the same time to similar Christians in similar situations, we put it all together. Specifically, the book does not ever once say, you're turning to a false gospel, that you have to both be circumcised and believe in Jesus to be saved. But we know that from the context. It's a large context. Uh, Keep that in mind, though, as we're marching through. Is you have to interpret this letter first in light of the letter itself, and then bring in the larger context. So don't let your uh, theology, your previous assumptions, influence how you interpret the book. Not how you interpret the book, and so that's how you view your theology. Uh, and I skipped over a phrase in the middle of verse 6. Uh, Him who called you in the grace of Christ... He's setting up for a big rant later when he goes between grace and law. He's setting up this dichotomy of grace and law, grace and law, grace and law. We're going to see it a bunch. So he slips it in here. I'm astonished that you're turning away so quickly from him who called you in the grace of Christ. Grace to a different gospel, and the different gospel is law. Okay. How are we actually saved? We're saved by grace to grace. We already talked about that. Verse 7. So, I'll read verse 6 again. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Uh, quick, just simple note on this. I, I like this as a, as a philosophical note. Truth doesn't change based on popular opinion. I'm astonished, astonished that you're being led away to this, this different gospel. Not that there is a different gospel. There is only one true gospel. And the other ones are false gospels. Even if everybody believed them, they'd still be false gospels. And that's what he's going to hammer home in a second. But truth doesn't change based on how many people believe it. 
But what if everybody, like everybody in the world, wants two plus two to be five? Yeah, it's it still doesn't equal <laughs> five. And that sucks. Right? Unless you add one more. Or what if we so if have we change like two plus two, two five, 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 five. I would recommend you read the book of the, the book called Nineteen Eighty Four by George Orwell. It yeah. deals with that exact problem. It's, it's a creepy book. Everyone wants two plus two to equal twenty two, and then you can make a logical case for that. Actually, yeah, they'd still be wrong. Or you have to redefine the word plus. There is no logical case for that. Adding a two to a two. Truth does not cease to be truth just because two plus two is also. Makes four. Correct. So it's what, like that but kind of a little bit looking at it. Two it's two like right. Truth doesn't right. become falsehood just That's because someone stopped movie. believing. Yeah. But what? But what if you never knew yeah. that it was the truth? Like what if everybody thought that two plus two was five? It still is. Two plus two is still equal five if no humans had ever lived on the earth. You mean four? It's three letters and two. It's not subjective to us. Yeah, um, six is three, yeah, move three. But six three, is three, and three is five, and five is four. And okay, so let's focus five. back in. So you just name it prime numbers. Focus back in. Except for six. Yeah, five is six. So yeah. Three is five. Six is five. Focus back in. The, all that to say, I, that's just a, another one of Paul's asides. Right? Not that there is isn't ever gospel. Truth's not going to change just because these people are saying the. Uh, verse eight, and he repeats it in verse nine. So if, verse eight. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so I say now again, if anyone is preaching you a different gospel contrary to the one we received, let him be accursed. But what about Muhammad? He was a good guy, wasn't he? Yeah, and he heard it straight from the angel Gabriel. And he right? also died, though, but didn't come back to life. Muhammad heard his gospel straight from the angel Gabriel, so he must... Be, wait, just wait, wait. What did he say? If anyone preached to you a different, go if 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 we or an angel from heaven, nope, that one's covered too. <laughs> what is the angel Gabriel? And I want to really, okay, the word accursed. He says it twice. Word anathema. You guys heard that? Yep. You're all so smart theologically. Anathema. Uh, it means it means quite literally condemned to hell. Okay. Let him be in hell. If he's preaching something other than this gospel, the one that I preached to you, even if I come back to you and preach a different gospel than the one I've already preached, that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, hell. Alright? And that's a pretty bold statement, right? He's saying, yeah, in the future, if I'm saying something different, don't listen to me. I'm crazy. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens, famous atheist, said the same thing. If I ever become a Christian in my in my last days, on my as, as a deathbed confession, don't believe me. I'm just talking crazy. That's <laughs> he's professing Christ now. Yeah, yeah. It's a little too late. Goodness. Too little, too late. It's okay, Grace. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it again now. Consider this question: What question should immediately be of importance to the reader when you hear this sentence? Even if if I, even if we or an angel should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. What question should pop in your mind? What does accursed mean? <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Why should they believe them then? What? Why should they believe them then the first time around? Because Jesus That's not the that. question I'm looking for. Or Repeat it. Repeat, uh, Repeat the, the, the sentence. What did they preach? Can you lose yourself? There you go. What is it? Gospel. What? What's the gospel, right? What's the gospel, right? What's the gospel that you preached to us in the beginning? See, the way it's a lot simpler than what we're trying What does a curse mean? Right? You hear the phrase, if somebody preaches you something different than what I said earlier, tell them to go to hell, and you don't know what he said earlier, you want to know what he said earlier, right? So, what is the gospel that he preached to him earlier? You're right, you're It's going to be our inside pitch. It's going to be our inside pitch. Because God would have thought he had, like, oh, right on the gospel. And he'd be like, okay. And he hasn't said it yet. He's going to say it throughout this whole book. But what is that gospel? If you've read this book before, we've said it many, many times already. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone. And it's not of your own, it's the gift of God. So, not for dailies. Uh, so the last two verses we're going to look at. Verses 10 through 12. So, uh, so, uh, those those three three <laughs> last three verses, yes. Uh, math is hard. 
<laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> okay, uh, you guys probably have a slightly different translation of verse 10. So I'm going to read my read along. For now, do I persuade men or God, or do I deserve to please men? If I still desire men, I would not be a slave of Christ. Uh, what do y'all have for that first question? Or am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Wait, one verse says, or am I trying to please people? Right. Any other translations of that first question? What is the verse? Verse 10. Verse 10 of Galatians. Or am I now seeking the favor of man or of God? Or am I now seeking the favor of man or of God? When the approval. When the approval. Stop sighing. Uh, what specifically is he saying? Like Nathan pointed out, it's confusing, right? Because then he follows it up with, or do I now desire to please men? Uh, it's, it's a confusing sentence in both English and in Greek, and most people can't really make sense of it. The exact, this is as close to the exact wording as you can get. For now, do I persuade men or God? So the question is, is he saying, am I trying to persuade people to believe the gospel or trying to persuade God to do something? The obvious answer to that question, I think, would be, well, he's trying to persuade men to do something. He's not going to try to persuade God to do something. Mm -hmm. that doesn't, that doesn't like that. Yeah. Right. Or is he saying, uh, am I trying to persuade anyone, or am I just stating the truth? Like, I'm not trying to persuade man or God, I'm just stating the facts. God's presented me to the facts. I think, essentially, what he's saying is what we're going to see in verse 11 and 12. But speaking totally honestly, I read four different yes. commentaries. Uh, translated this two different ways. It, I don't know what he's saying. I don't okay. get what that first question means. That kind of makes sense. Uh, Do I persuade? Yeah. Like, it's too you have the facts, you're presenting them to man or God, and then do I desire to please men? Do you, are you going to appease the will of men and their sinful nature? Right. And that's, and that's why I think the, the point. Whatever he's, he's trying to say in verse 10, the point is what he says in verse 11 and 12. Uh, I would have you know the gospel that, I, that was preached by me is not man's gospel. So the point is, look, I didn't get this gospel from men. I got it from God. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is where he sets up the argument that we're going to look at next week, which is the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2, which is, uh, look, th this is God's gospel that I'm on. This is the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. Good old Stephen Curtis Chapman. Nope. Which one? No, third day. No, what song? Wait, what song is it? Rich Mullins is the original. What song? What song is it? Creed. Third day. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. That's not so you're young and you're young. Yeah. Yeah. You're catching the second wave. Yeah. Yeah. Third, I think third days is Whatever, okay. I don't, I don't even know what I don't even really know what Whatever Whatever it's called. Whatever it's called. It's called Creed? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying it's When did he receive it through Jesus Christ? What? What? When did he receive this gospel as a revelation through Jesus Christ? On the road to Damascus. Interesting. Okay. I thought you might say that. Are well, you no. sure? That means we're wrong. Wait, I don't actually know. Well, <laughs> what did he receive on the road to Damascus? Like, what, what exactly happened on the road to Damascus? Blindness. Blindness. <laughs> he was tripped blind. What, you, what, you, what, you, what exactly happened? Someone oh, turned so around. Saul, why are you walking with the donkey? said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he said, uh, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. He uses the covenant name of God, Yahweh. Jesus, whom you're persecuting. I'm the guy. Uh, Struck blind, then he goes to Ananias' house. Ananias preaches the gospel to him. Uh, the reason I, I, in essence, yes, he, he got a straight from there. But uh, but he probably knew the gospel before, though, because he was stoning Christians or persecuting He probably have, would have had to know the gospel. I think he knew that Jesus was who not the Old Testament was talking about. He also says in a couple places he seems to intimate that he actually received further revelation directly from Jesus Christ beyond just the right. Damascus. Or, well, yeah, there, there's, a, yeah uh, there's a couple different times where he says, oh no, like I was talking specifically to Jesus. Like, 
we were we were face to face, and he was telling me exactly what I'm telling you. Uh, and there's a couple places we won't dig into them for time's sake, but uh, I would encourage you to look those up. Maybe Google it. It's pronounced Google. This this particular statement, though, this serves two purposes. One, it sums up the point that he's, of this previous section. So, this is a unique gospel. Right? No other one. If anybody comes to you, if an angel comes to you uh, with a different gospel than this one, let him be accursed. This is the gospel. I got it from Jesus himself. And it transitions into what he's about to go into a rant of, of, look, I'm an apostle. I've got all these credentials. And the biggest credential I can give you is Jesus told me. And you can talk, a, talk a bunch about, um, about how he received this gospel from Jesus. Never say that again. So that's what we're going to look at next week, which will be verses 113 through 210. So if you want to read, hey, that's Mother's Day. No hey, way. That's too I would much. highly, highly, highly recommend that you read through the whole book of Galatians twice before next home group. And that sounds like a big, what? big task. It's, it's like really not. It's, not. it's like five. One more. Yeah, it's, not like it's, it's, not it, it's, it's, it's six five. chapters. It takes maybe it's half five. an hour if you're reading pretty slow. Um, I don't know. I can read yeah. pretty <laughs> slow. <laughs> It Just depends on if I'm reading it or reading it for comprehension. Oh, yeah. also get, get the flow of the argument. Get to know what he's saying in the book. Okay? That will really help you as we're interpreting it as we go.